With no further ado then, perhaps we can, can start with uh, Victor's response to this first question. So can it focus on the importance of enhancing broader skills to attract from student learning in disciplinary context at university? Hello, everybody. When uh, Joe sent an email to us uh, late last week, early this week, about what we were going to discuss on the panel, what I did was went and read Greg's abstract, and then when I did that, I read Joe's uh, very well written uh, email to us about what he wanted us to do. What it did is it took me back to the past when I first uh, became a psychologist, and in those days, there was a lot of discussion and debate about critical thinking and problem solving and the teaching of those skills in the context of content and whether or not it detracted or enhanced content or what I'm going to talk about now about what the most effective ways of teaching critical thinking and problem solving skills might be. So in those days there were two dominant views about uh, critical thinking in particular and problem solving. And one is what we would call the generalist approach. And the person who is most noted, world famous for the work in this area, is Robert Ennis. And Robert Ennis, uh, his view was that critical thinking involving skills like grasping arguments, making arguments, understanding the authority of sources, being able to process effectively cause and effect relationships, and so on, were uh, multi-dimensional skills. The most important thing that he said was that these skills consist of independent cognitive abilities that can be taught in relation to any propositional content. Innes and many others at that time, in fact, they were the dominant view, argued that the way that we should be teaching critical thinking is in the abstract. My first job, uh, in graduate school was in the Cal State University system. And at that time, my first or second year there, there was a decree from the chancellor's office in the Cal State system is that students in the Cal State system shall think critically. <laughs> the way that we're going to do that is they're going to take Critical Thinking 101. And uh, as I had said someone before, it's that you will be a critical thinker if you get a C or better in that course. But the, the, the approach was to teach critical thinking in the abstract, and then it could be applied to the disciplinary contents that students might go in. We'll contrast that to what we call the specialist view. And, and John McPeck, uh, a Canadian philosopher, is the uh, most well-known person in that area. Uh, and McPeck defines uh, critical thinking as the appropriate use of reflective judgment, and this is the key part, within the area under consideration. McPeck says that uh, critical thinking skills, in order to develop effectively, must, not should, or ought, but must be taught within the context of domain-specific knowledge. What he said was that we cannot separate the domain from the critical thinking. The more experience and background you have in the domain, what he shows, and now there's actually a fair amount of research that shows this to be the case, the more the critical thinking skills develop in that area. However, one becomes strong in critical thinking in an area, that does not automatically generalize to one's critical thinking skills and abilities in other areas. So as an example, Greg, if someone learns to develop critical thinking skills by being a psychology major or a classicist and then goes into a business area, what Mipek would argue is that it's not very likely that, that those skills acquired in that field or discipline would generalize, in this case, to the workplace. I mean, these are both the strong views in, in, in this area. I want to read just, uh, and then I'll quickly end here. If I were to put my disagreement with the general thinking movement into bold relief, it's in this. In their attempt to develop critical thinking, they have the order of cause and effect reversed. They believe that if you train students in certain logical skills, fallacies, etc., the result will be a general improvement in each of the disciplines and qualities of mind. Whereas I contend that if we improve the quality of understanding through the disciplines, 
which may have little to do with formal logic. That is what, that's the kind of thing that was often taught in Critical Thinking 101, how to do syllogisms, deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning, and so on. You will then get a cognitive improvement in the thinking capacity. This is his approach. I, I remember reading many years ago, I was trying, while you were talking, Greg, sorry. I was trying to find the, the year and the citation. Richard Nisbet, psychologist of Michigan, published a number of studies about statistical reasoning. And uh, one of the things that I remember from that research, I'm certain it's true, is that he showed that the, student, the more students had formal training in statistical reasoning, the more likely they would be able to solve real world problems related to the law of large numbers, a really critical, the foundational construct in statistical reasoning. And he found this to be to generalize to other situations. What he in fact did is took students that were in these statistics course and then had their phone numbers and called them at home and asked them questions that involved understanding of the law of uh, large numbers. And what he found was the more background you had in that discipline, the more likely you were able to find uh, to solve that particular problem in that context. So that's what I have to say for now. Excellent. Thanks very much. Ben. Okay. Well, those of you who know me from my 90-minute keynotes will be surprised that I can answer the question in one word. Uh, uh, can it? Yes, it can. Obviously, it can. If you take time away from disciplinary content to talk about uh, other skills, obviously, you could be at risk. Um, I think when you look at studies like one out of the Weinberg Institute at, at UBC a few years back, uh, when you when you allow students to work in groups in active learning kind of methodologies, they get through 10 or so less percent of the content in the time allotted that you might get through plowing through lecture, but they retain twice as much. So, uh, you know, can it detract? Yes, but it's going to leave students knowing what they want. Uh, must it detract? I thought I'll start twisting this question a little bit. Well, must it? Maybe, but not necessarily. I think you can do it in a way that doesn't. Should it detract is the question I want to talk about because, because I think it, you know maybe it's a good thing in some disciplines for us to focus less on disciplinary content. Um, yeah, now, you know, I'm speaking as a humanities grad student who spent 10 years studying English lit and Shakespeare and eventually got off the rails about halfway through a thesis. Uh, but, you know, and, and it may be that I, I believe humanities instructors uh, and liberal arts and science instructors believe they're teaching far more than just disciplinary content. They're teaching, uh, they're educating the future generation of responsible citizens. They're teaching people to be critical thinkers about statistics, about political lies, and all kinds of manipulations out there. Uh, and I think the, the challenge we've got is that it's just far too easy to measure disciplinary specific knowledge in, in, in ways that we're all too familiar with. And it's very easy to design cognitive studies, like science studies, that are focused on memorization of disciplinary knowledge. And so we put a lot of attention on that issue because it's so easy to define, I think Greg was saying. Uh, the challenge is how do you define critical thinking in order to assess it? That, that becomes a fundamental problem. I suspect that my perspective doesn't as completely describe the professional faculties, law, medicine, uh, engineering, where you want the person designing your bridge to have some discipline-specific knowledge. Um, but, but you know, like the vast majority of undergrad or grad students in English Lit, I hope I won't steal any of your points. Uh, like, like most of them, I, I thought I was going to be an English professor until the day I dropped out of the PhD program, and, and then discovered that most of us gravitate into marketing. And, and you know, I went through a circuitous life, really, uh, through graphic design, marketing, IT consulting, public relations, higher ed market research, amateur print journalist with the top ten, and, and now video podcaster on trends in higher education. Plug for 10withken.com. Um, the, the, the content I learned, though, the content I learned in 10 years of English study is largely forgotten, I hate to say this, uh, and it's mostly irrelevant. Uh, you know, minor Elizabethan poets, uh, playwrights, Anglo-Saxon linguistics, I don't find call to use that on a day-to-day -day basis. There's no dinner party I've discovered where I can make small talk like that. And even, even studying Shakespeare, 90% of that, no one knows what you're talking about. Uh, and I go to Stratford a couple times a year just so I can dust off the cobwebs from those corners in my brain because I, you, you just don't use the disciplinary specific stuff. 
And while you know, we talk about teaching communication skills, the vast majority of what we do in teaching students to read and write for scholarly journals and scholarly audiences, uh, or even to read and write Shakespeare or Milton, does very little to prepare them to communicate in the world outside the walls of, uh, of the institution. The, 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 you know, I learned how to be, um, how to obfuscate, how to hide behind hundreds of footnotes and authorities, and how to take 750 words to make one point, but, but not necessarily how to be concise and communicate in a way that, you know, I had to unlearn all of that once I hit uh, the real world of marketing and business. Uh, and I think while we say we want people to be critical thinkers, I also just want to throw out there that I think we can go too far. You can have too much of a good thing. Too much critical thinking is paralyzing. Uh, and really it's a yin and yang between creative and critical or, or synthetic and analytic thinking. That we, need, we need people to be critical thinking and clearly there's not enough of it in our world today. But if we go too far, we're going to get into trouble. So, so what I learned from English Lit and from my university education, uh, the, the valuable skills I learned were accidental. They were communication, they were critical thinking and an evaluation of evidence. There, there were close reading of texts uh, and fine tuning of language. Those are useful skills in work. Uh, interpreting actors on stage in Shakespeare and trying to read behind their lines is very similar to what I do in the observation room of a focus group, trying to figure out what students are really saying around the table as they talk about what they think about an institution, it's a choice they went through to go to the secondary. Um, it, it, a lot of that, though, is really uh, accidental learning that arose um, in a very inefficient way, frankly, from studying Milton and Shakespeare and a lot of other things. Uh, I think we could teach it directly uh, in courses on rhetoric, in courses on business communication, in courses on uh, effective argument logic. Uh, you know, the philosophy professor, I can understand him thinking that within a discipline you can develop, because you can actually spend time in philosophy talking about these things in the abstract, just as you can in psychology. Um, anyway, I'm going to go on way too long. But uh, I think right now we're at an interesting time for cognitive scientists to help figure these things out, that we've got a convergence of four things that are going to make it really pretty important to define what we mean by these other skills and, and to learn how to assess them. Uh, and those four things that are converging are, are employer demands. Uh, we've got increasing, uh, increasingly vocal employers talking about how they want workplace skills and yet they won't give young people job experiments in order to gain those skills. Uh, augmented memory. We're, we're, we're in a world now in which the internet has turned on its head this idea that memorization of fact is an education at all. Google in your pocket means facts are available to you anytime. A certain level of memorization is no longer important. Uh, and, and we're also looking at artificial intelligence and software computational models to try to develop uh, um, artificial intelligence, I would argue, is the third piece coming in on us here. Uh, computer scientists want to develop higher order order cognitive skills in the computers. And by 2024, uh, Moore's Law tells us we will have computers for $1,000 capable of 10,000 trillion cycles per second, the same as the human brain. So, so the expectation is that the software won't keep up, but, but in the next 10 years, we're going to see increasingly smart algorithms like Siri, like Watson, like Viv, that are able to exercise more and more of these skills if we can figure out how to define them and, and therefore how to, how to develop the software. So, so between employers and the internet and artificial intelligence, and finally the pressures towards other forms of evaluation, whether we talk about prior learning assessment, credit transfer, uh, badging, and, and competence-based evaluation of students, there's a lot going on in the education sector and politically that's pushing as well. So we're trying to get better at assessing learning outcomes. And, and so I, I, I'm excited to see what happens over the next decade or so. Uh, and I should stop because I'm sure. Perfect. Thank you very much. Justin. Hey. Um, so I started my journey here at Matt pursuing neuroscience with hopes of being a therapist or a psychologist. And how did I end up? Where did I end up going? I graduated with a degree in English and Cultural Studies. So that wasn't really the plan I had intended. And you might ask, like many people do, why did you switch over? That's a, that's a very large leap. And I guess the reason is there was something that was 
lacking, but I couldn't quite place it at the time. I couldn't, there was an itch that I needed to scratch, and I couldn't really figure out what that was. And I eventually learned later on through my uh, undergrad and taking some time off that it was like the soft skills that we all talk about that I, would, that I really craved, that I really wasn't getting in those programs. Um, basic topics with no defined right or wrong answer. Um, science is very black and white because it needs to be. And I'm someone who really does like live in the gray. And questions that have no defined answers are questions that I often like talking about the most, essentially. My two favorite topics to discuss are religion and politics. <laughs> Not very popular, that's part of it. And I think the appeal to me is that there is no universal truth in those things. There, you have people on the left, people on the right. You have people of all different kinds of philosophies, but they all believe their own thing. And I like the idea of taking certain information and looking at uh, facts that exist, critically analyzing it, and coming forward with uh, my own personal belief, and then challenging someone else, then hearing their side of things. So I, I, I like that type of education and interaction, and that's really what I found in English culture studies, philosophy, ethics, and critical thinking. And topics like politics, there is no universal right to have very extreme thoughts on different things. Some things work, some things don't. If you're a socialist, you're a capitalist. They're very different. Is there one that's right? I might be on one side, but that doesn't make it universally true. Um, with Donald Trump being a good president, that's not universal truth. Um, maybe it may happen. It might, like, I don't think, I think it is, but. Uh, it's not something that is defined in stone. So I really believe that enhancing broader skills and learning disciplinary content is really part of the same overall picture. Um, what is the point of teaching students various advanced cognitive tasks if they are unable to implement those tasks in a basic kind of way? Uh, the marriage of these two ideologies really do feed into each other to create overall richer experience for the learner. The question we need to ask ourselves with regards to learning and teaching is how do we enhance non-disciplinary skills in a way that also makes the disciplinary content more digestible? Um, essentially, how can we work the two together? Rather than slapping in something that just checks off various boxes, uh, what intelligence system can be designed that caters toward optimal learning? Um, in order to learn the advanced skills in essay writing, for example, a student must first understand the basics of proper essay formatting and structure. Beyond that, the student needs to have a very in-depth understanding of literary devices such as metaphors, imagery, solutions, etc. Basic concepts. Uh, these same principles apply to all disciplines from English to mathematics. One of the main differences between a robot and a human being is our ability to critically analyze the information that we are receiving. So to answer the question that's posed directly, um, enhancing broader skills in the classroom does not to track student learning of physical content if it is done properly. And that's kind of the key part, I think. Um, I, in fact, when it's applied properly, the broader skills will enhance the overall learning experience and therefore provide each student with tools they will need to not only obtain a more holistic understanding of the, discipl the disciplinary content, but also then to apply to real world situations where your broader skills will lead your overall success. So that's kind of how I look at that overall topic. And a lot of my learning does come inside the classroom, being from the university. Um, things like social interactions, understanding, coping with failure, multitasking, dealing with stress, really just discovering who I am. Um, those are all things that I learned outside the classroom, dealing with some class content. So it is a very holistic approach to education and learning. Um, as a film major, uh, currently, and that's my aspiration going forward. I aspire to connect my audience. My number one goal is to make the audience feel, and I feel like that's what educators should be doing with uh, those that they're teaching. So, those are my answers on that question. Great, thank you. Craig, any, any reflections on uh, the panelists' comments or, or additional thoughts from you? Yeah, at risk of uh, over, overstaying my welcome with this audience, I, one of the things that, that I found myself reacting to and uh, stimulated by was Victor's very interesting reflections on this, the, the, uh, the generalist and the, uh, the, the, the 
more specialist kind of approach, and this is something, although this is not a literature that I have anything like familiarity with that Victor does. It's, I know a bit of that literature. And it, it's, it, it, it's got to be logically, um, no pun intended, it's, it, it has to be a difficult area to, 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 to explore because um, the, work, the work that I have seen, I mean, first of all, I think that, that the model that says if you teach formal logic in a sort of formal, so sort of you look at your thinking in, a, in an abstract way, independent of discipline, etc. One question is, does that gen generalize to other disciplines? And that question, I guess, one could, one could, uh, one could explore. Um, I think the more practical question, and this relates to some of the things you were saying today in your workshop, it's, it's the kind of more practical issues of problem solving and critical thinking within a particular discipline. So the difficulty of asking whether things transfer and generalize is that <coughs> in order to compare, you need to have a literacy at the same level as within a discipline. So if you want to say there's someone's expertise in chemistry and critical thinking and problem solving in chemistry, generalized to psychology, they're going to have to have the same knowledge base in the two areas in order to be able to hold that constant if you want in order to, to see whether you know, this other variable varies it. it I, that's, all, that's actually far more technical and, and hypothetical than I, I really want to, to convey. The broader point I want to make is that, that as I thought about this and read a little bit about it, the, the problem solving critical thinking skills for me are very practical. Know, that I, I see them more and more as having very practical applications in a whole series of areas. And I think that much of the literature in the past has abstracted them a little too much. And I think that we need to think, rethink what it means to be a practical problem thinker, problem solver, a critical thinker, right? And, and the, the definition operationally, um, I think, needs to be explored and, and perhaps expanded. That's about the best I can do after. <laughs> <laughs> we need to talk a lot today, too. No, that's great. I think really interesting that with one question, three or four very different perspectives are brought to the fore, which makes very clear to me, at least, how this is a, a key and, and rich area for discussion and will continue to be uh, for much of the, the time to come. Looking at the time, I wonder if there are questions uh, for the panel from the audience, things that you'd like to ask, either responses to this question or, or other things connecting to the symposium theme more broadly. Please. Um, hi. Um, I have a question that uh, was both to the talk and what was being discussed here. Just this, um, just my thought is uh, we're thinking about this as sort of implementing new ideas in the higher education and kind of changing the things we're talking about, how stocky and actually conservative universities are in an odd way, right? Um, but are we not actually harking back to the time where it really was thought that we are teaching humanities and arts and social sciences, and those are like the most important things to learn, and still the technical things you can pick up whenever. I would say even, even just 20 years ago, that was the talk. Now, I almost wonder, I, I'm going to be on this, but uh, if it's kind of like the tech boom, doc hop boom, you don't need a degree, you just need to be able to code. This is sort of the narrative that people are getting. And you know, no, you never need to code with someone who's not um, But you can, you can make it on your own without knowing any of this other junk. To succeed, you just need to give it this one thing, like go ahead. And it almost seems like we, we're, we're all talking about going back to a time. Responses to, to that comment. Anyone want to jump in? Well, I, I've been thinking about entrepreneurship quite a bit this month, and and I, I think you know our students are graduating into an economy here in Canada in which more and more of them are going to be self-employed, freelance, or contract workers. They're going to need to be flexible and resourceful, lifelong learners. Uh, but I think more than ever, there's an advantage to the breadth of education rather than disciplinary depth. And I guess that's my concern about it. From my experience 20 or 30 years ago, English was far too narrow and deep. I studied English literature, didn't read American literature, didn't read Australian literature, didn't read anything outside of the canon of English lit. More courses in statistics would have helped in terms of interpreting what's happening in the world 
right? I mean, I think everyone would be more statistically literate. You want, I think the, our society would be a better place if everyone were taking a course or two in statistics, if everyone were taking a course or two in rhetoric so they could dissect and see what politicians are doing to them. Uh, but, but I think if you're going to be self-employed or entrepreneurs, you, you need that breadth of disciplinary ability, the kind of scattergun thing. And Steve Jobs is often trotted out as an example of someone who didn't need no education. But actually, he, he audited all kinds of courses in, in Zen, in ethics, in, in typography, and pulled it together. And I think you know that's that synthetic thing that's the opposite of analytic that I that I, I encourage more of. Any other comments on that point? Uh, I think you're right in the sense that uh, I do see it not something new, but almost going back to a time when like that was more of the norm. One example is like whenever I tell when people in my program say, "Oh, I graduated with English," cultural studies people often say, "Well, what are you gonna do with that?" That's kind of what they always tend to be. Oh, what if that's then I'm long telling me, "Well, that's pretty useless. Why would you waste your time there?" And I hear in the news people say, "Why would we allow our students to go to school and study something as silly as history? Because what are you gonna do with that?" And there was a time when going to school and getting those degrees were valuable, and now it seems to be kind of a taboo topic. And from someone who went through that program, I, I, this is I could go on forever about the value of the program and everything I learned, especially in cultural studies. Like learning the world around you is, I think, very important. And learning different perspectives that are not your own. So you're right in the sense that bringing back the non-taboo, non-taboo idea of education being uh, not something new, but redefining the courses that we take to be more uh, the way it used to be, and less less so, oh, what do you do with that? Oh, you're not an engineer? Oh, you, how are you going to get a job? So just that's the whole kind of thought process on education as a whole. It's the same, same thing in college. People would say, oh, you're going to go to college or university? There's a, there's a weird connotation that one isn't as good as the other. When in the other day, education should be about becoming more learned. So. Yeah. I think it's really interesting how those kinds of pressures, too, about packing your own education can prompt conversations within the academy that get us thinking about what are the, the things that we value and the things that we do and promote this kind of discussion. Yeah, maybe one more question. Well, it builds on this. So, at the break, we were talking about how it sort of struck us as a surprising thing that the word retention never came up in the talk uh, that received the panel. And I think that that, as, as far as a priority for a lot of administrations, is part of the, the commodification of the bachelors. Like, what is the value, almost like a product, as opposed to some sort of intrinsic statement of its, um, its worth. But you know, telling the parents what this degree, if you get it, will get your kid. Um, and I think those soft skills are probably saleable as here's what your, your, your child could get a job in if they had this degree. I think that could be part of that language. And yet it also, I feel like, runs the risk of veering away from that former understanding of the work of education, understanding history so that we have a perspective on the world, or, you know, whatever it is. But I feel like we're having parallel conversations and one side of the conversation is the administration pushing the business aspect of college and the educational aspect of what should we know and why should we care about what we should know. I feel like those are parallel things. It was interesting that it didn't come up as a buzzword retention or but I thought that sort of built on what you were saying and, and what you were talking about. I'd like to comment on that. In the United States now, perhaps in Canada, and other places as well, there is, uh, in STEM areas, the big focus of uh, granting agents, both federal agencies like National Science Foundation, but also private foundations, instead is on persistence in STEM to graduation. In other words, the ultimate outcome is not where what Greg was talking about in terms of these kind of soft skills or critical thinking and so on, but getting people to a degree, there must, there's an implication there, you might think, right, that what, if we, we can only get them there, they will possess what uh, they need to possess to succeed in the workplace. 
in the STEM area. That hasn't always been true. I mean, it, 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 in NSF, there was earlier on, not too far earlier on, more of a focus on understanding the development of cognitive skills and other kinds of skills that are important for success in that area. So I hadn't thought about this before this way, but good comment. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I had a question. There were a couple of interesting points raised near the end of Greg's talk, uh, where he talked about integrating high-quality learning experiences being important to develop these skills, um, and you know the shifting uh, demographics of uh, people entering university. And I'll, and I'll use Ontario as an example. We have a population of about 14 million, um, and there was a provincial report I think in 2012 with the stated aim of having 70% of the population attain post-secondary education. So, and for people visiting from the states, that must sound like an astounding number, 70% of the population. Um, so does that change everything that we we're talking about when we have that many people going to universities? Yeah, it's been an ongoing change for 50 years though. Uh, but, but absolutely, we've got several things happening simultaneously. We've got uh, a larger percentage of high undergrad going to university in particular, and therefore three quarters of them wouldn't have been here prior, so the, the nature of the institution's changing. We've got more and more ESL students, more and more first generation Canadian students or new immigrants whose language and cultural barriers are present. Uh, there are, there are the, the changing nature of the Canadian, of the Ontario student and the Canadian student is going to have a huge impact on how we teach and, and how institutions uh, support the students' need. Yeah. Just sort of another bit of shameless promotion. There's a, a book that myself and three colleagues wrote called Academic Transformation um, that looked historically and, and currently and looked forward in the Ontario post secondary sector. And I, I, Ken said, I think this transformation has been going on for a while now. But you're right, if anything, it's going to be accelerated. And I, I think, I think it, it demands a fundamental rethink of how we restructure and reapproach the system in order to retain what's at its heart and what's, what's truly valuable about it. And if we don't, we'll lose that. Because, you know, I have colleagues, and you probably do as well, and I just disagree with them entirely, which is that they say, well, most of those students don't, don't belong in because they don't, they don't um, fit the, the kind of model, the, the, the sort of model of the past, which I think is largely mythical, of, of the, the student who was here only for learning and is simply wanting to become a better person and wasn't worried about the future or how to contribute to the future. And he says, people who don't think like that shouldn't be here. I don't agree. I mean, I do think that the university and post-secondary education fundamentally is important. I don't know if it's 70% is the right number, but it's a high number in today's world. And, um, but we're going to have to rethink it. And I was saying to Ken earlier today, when I graduated from my high school in Quebec, a long time ago, I think 5% of us went on to university. And you know, we were a particular bunch. I mean, you said we were an elite in the sense not that we were privileged financially or anything else, or that we were particularly smarter than anyone else, but we had that kind of academic interest. We, we were interested in and we had a particular characteristic. And so the way that the demographic has changed is it's changed in the ways that, that Ken spoke to, and those are really important. But it's also changed just fundamentally what people are looking for in, in, in the in a university education. And we have to be responsive to that. I think it's irresponsible not to be. And that doesn't mean abandoning the most important things that, that students can get at university. And I think that this way of thinking and focusing on the non-content skills, not to the not to the exclusion. I mean, obviously today that's what I was talking about. Of course, the content of what we do in university programs is very important too. But I think in focusing on that stuff, we may resolve some of that apparent um, conflict that you want between what's necessary in the workplace and what's necessary and, and what's fundamental to what we want students to take away. Because I think personally, I think it's the same thing. Up until the 60s or 70s, I think it's fair to say that if you got to university, you didn't have to worry about finding employment when you graduated. I never. And profs didn't have to worry about teaching and learning supports, and 
uh, you know, it, it, the nature of the world now is that if students are coming to us hoping they're going to get a job, and, and the reality is that that ratio is totally different. Uh, you got to be conscious of giving them employability skills and helping them on that pathway. And maybe it's not to happen within the disciplines. Maybe it's career support services. Maybe it's various kinds of other uh, value-added services that we can't afford. But but uh, you know the, the nature of what we're giving them at the university has to be more than just the traditional because the, the labor market is so different now. Yeah, maybe I'll take an opportunity to jump in with a question too. Then I wonder if based. Sorry. You've earned it. Thank you. <laughs> Based on some of this conversation, uh, thinking to a larger theme of the symposium, what are the, the opportunities for cognitive psychologists or, or disciplinary researchers more broadly to help us think about working through and addressing some of these challenges? And, and where are the, the roadblocks that, that researchers are going to encounter in thinking these through? It's great moderating asking a question that just. <laughs> <laughs> At lunch, we did have this conversation, and certainly one of the obstacles is that the, the, the variability between students and between profs has a bigger impact on learning outcomes than our little tiny adjustments to one facet of delivery. So scientifically studying what improves education is hard when, when there's human beings involved so much. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe Maybe you know MOOC, edX, and other sorts of MOOC platforms give us an opportunity to get such a large enzyme that we can get a reliable read on minor tweaks. Uh, anyway, but, but I think that's certainly. I think part of your question was asking about what's in our way, and I think that's one of the things we've got to figure out how to get around. Yeah, humans get in the way. That's, that's a good point. <laughs> one of the areas that cognitive science can play a really important role related to critical thinking and problem solving is in the area of matching the instruction to the desired learning outcome. If we look at the research that many of us have uh, spoke about here and elsewhere in this area, the, the, the mode of instruction has been geared towards the specific learning of academic content or research content in our labs. But I know little, maybe none, but little research that has had as the desired learning outcome, you know, a particular higher order problem solving skill or the ability to make certain causal connections or to engage in certain kinds of statistical reasoning as opposed to learning whether A plus B equals C and so on. So one area in which there can be a development is uh, you know, what we call transfer appropriate instruction. Right? This is an area where you match the instructional delivery with, in a way that supports the development of that outcome. So test-enhanced learning is a really effective way to get people to acquire certain kinds of knowledge, maybe basic knowledge or transfer knowledge, but it probably wouldn't be a particularly effective way to build certain kind of generative problem-solving skills. So I think that could be an area for development. Yep. I mean, John, Catherine, do you know of work in that area? I don't, I don't know of work in that area. Not right off the top of my head, no. Yeah, I mean, I don't. So it's a project for somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Next year. That's right. <laughs> Maybe time for one last question from the, the audience. Yes, yes. Uh, can you talk about the professional conferences and about the uh, emphasis um, but I like this very content. We got three representative expectations. They seem to have a very broad uh, array of skills already. Do you assess that at an absolute level? Since so you already have some, some, some assessment clearly, is it more fair to do it relative? Like, I guess I'm just a second line. Just seems like a thrill that you could get up and say a couple sentences about the whisper of the class. Uh, is it fair to assess that achievement higher than a high performing public speaker who has not change level at all? Do you assess it at an absolute or relative level? Or relative, how do you effectively assess that? It depends on the purpose of your assessment. If you're trying to judge what value add the teacher or institution is giving, then relative makes sense. I think for employers, prior learning, recognition, competency-based evaluation, I mean, ultimately, we just want to know which boxes have they completely satisfied so we can evaluate and applicant. Right, and how much have they improved this year, which doesn't really help us. 
I mean, I think the first thing we need to do is, and I think many people are doing some good work in this area, is we need to come up with practical and, and valid assessments for this stuff. And then I think we can start exploring those questions in a meaningful way. Um, I, I think I'm certainly not suggesting that in my own mind that we would begin to use these things as sort of entrance requirements. So we have, I think we're a long way from that day, and I'm not sure if we ever want to do that. Sort of reflecting on an Android. Duckworth's work on resilience is that she was developing measures and it, it took almost no time at all for people to misuse them. So. <laughs> I think it's also important for the university or the institution to give each student the tools that like, will help them excel in whatever field that they're in. So if some students start off further behind in certain areas, um, I think it's institutions' responsibility to kind of help them along the way to really build them up so the learning outcomes and the person they become after school can ultimately succeed, help them succeed in anything they try to do. So uh, some people might need more attention than others, and I think it's really a collaboration between faculty, TAs, and kind of the overall body of the university to provide those tools to make sure the best experience is being achieved by all students. Great. I think that's a great note for us to, to wrap this portion up on.